So with a few words, uh, I will formally open this public defense um, in Swedish disputation by John Paul Saccarini, who will defend his PhD thesis, Circanalysis, Circus Therapy and Psychoanalysis for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Performance Studies. And as you've heard, uh, the exam is awarded by Stockholm University and it's based on an agreement with the University of Dance and Circus. And today's faculty opponent is doctor and senior lecturer Helen Stoddart, University of Glasgow, Scotland, United Kingdom. Uh, that could be a good pronunciation perhaps today. We also have an evaluation committee consisting of three members, a betygsnemd in Swedish, and they are Vilmar Sauter, Professor Emeritus in Performance Studies, Stockholm University, sitting on the front row here. Uh, we have Christina Hagström Stoll, Visiting Professor in Artistic Research, the Stockholm Ac Academy of Dramatic Arts. And Gerhard Eckel, sitting next to her, Professor of Computer Music and Multimedia, the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, Austria. So in Sweden, a public defense uh, of a PhD dissertation is usually opened by very short comments by the so-called respondent, that is the author of the thesis. It can, for example, deal with errors in publi the publication process. However, in this um, context, uh, we have decided to do it differently because this work has included artistic dimensions. Hence, John Paul Saccarini will start by performing a lecture demonstration, that is a performative event, in which he will give his own summary of the thesis. And after that, without an intermission, just a few seconds, we will continue with the actual discussion. Uh, so, John Paul, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Eva. <coughs> <coughs> I'm just going to start with a very quick, a very, very, very quick warm-up because I'm a, you know, I'm a retired circus artist, and uh, in certain terms of the fact, I don't do this stuff anymore. Um, and uh, I thought to myself, what would be the most appropriate thing to, to do next? You know, what would uh, gratify my masochism, uh, the same way that circus does, and give me kind of intense moments of pleasure for very much, 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 much hard work. Um, and I thought, well, PhD obviously would be the thing to, the way to go forward in terms of satisfying my masochism, and it, and it worked. Um, <clears throat> so, so th there's a there's a researcher, <clears throat> you know, a psychoanalytic researcher in in one place, and there's a still a kind of circus artist in one place. And I thought, well, who am I on? I have to perform this my, my research as a way of exposing my research. And so I, I worked with a director to kind of find some, some to physicalize it. So I, the researcher actually was this kind of quite bouncy, quite light uh, feeling, you know, these I ideas of flight and kind of acrobatics that, and ideas of them. And then on the other hand, there was a kind of circus artist which was kind of uh, grounded, a bit more kind of, uh, a bit more down there. And I thought, well, well what is this combination of, of, of a circus artist that is totally embedded in the muscularity of flight? You know, it's not an illusion. I mean, it is an illusion, but actually, if you're ever up there pretending to be light, you've got no idea how muscular and how heavy you are <clears throat> there. And then, and then the researcher who's thinking through theories. And so I'm trying to think, what's the combination of, of, of the walk? <laughs> this is a difficulty as artist, as researcher. And then I, yeah, yeah, here I am. There, that's kind of what I came up with. <laughs> so it's kind of like uh, quite a lot of fun, but I'm actually not getting anywhere. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's circus and there's psychoanalysis, you know, makes psychoanalysis. Um, and it's very interesting that in both uh, situations, like coming on stage to do a rope routine or coming on stage to present my research, I get exactly the same symptoms of anxiety. I'm still short of breath, wobbly legs, a bit dizzy, um, heart palpitations, um, wanting to run away, wanting to poo constantly. And what's significant is the sweaty palms, you know, the sweaty palms. And it's directly connected to me coming on stage and not being able to get it up. I mean, not being able to get up uh, <laughs> the rope, you know. Um, so it's interesting how anxiety comes to the same place um, again and again. And the body doesn't lie. You know, I can calm myself down and 
and pretend that everything is okay, but actually the body always tells the truth. Now, this isn't fear. Fear is a reaction. Fear is like when a lion walks in a room, I have a reaction, and I disappear. Anxiety is something different. Anxiety is about a possibility. It's a signal. It's a possibility um, of failure. And psychoanalysis has this rather counterintuitive theory about anxiety, is that it is actually the effect that occurs when you're too close to your object of desire. Okay. It's like you're too close to what you really want. Okay, so object of desire. We talk about objects in psychoanalysis, objects of desire, subjects that desire objects. Uh, you know, the rope, this was my object. And by the way, can we get this out of the way? This rope is not a penis, all right? <laughs> I climbed up and down this rope, producing small gasps of pleasure in the audience. You know, and I kept a nice steady rhythm, keeping them going until the end, and I'd have chuck out a few tricks that I have up my sleeve that causes an eruption of applause, but it's not a penis. <laughs> so object is psychoanalytic term, and my theory, my research here is about the subject of circus, not the object. The object is the artifact that the subject produces, and insofar as psychoanalysis sees the ego as an object, an object which has clear parameters, it's an image, you can see it's the story that I tell to you every time I meet <clears throat> someone new, it's this identity that I'm very conscious of. The subject, is, not, is, is unconscious, and Lacanian psychoanalysis, which is my theory of choice for, for psychotherapy, um, the concern of Lacanian psychoanalysis is the, is the unconscious and the subject, insofar as the subject is unconscious. So there are also these things called partial objects, the famous, the famous part objects that Melanie Klein introduced, and that, which Lacan doesn't give enough credit to her for, for this. Partial objects, parts of the body which the infant invests with an awful lot of desire. Um, objects that the body expels, um, that the infant can either give as a gift or receive milk, the breast, as a gift. So this can be a gift to you. It's no wonder that yesterday I said to someone, yeah, come tomorrow to see my thing. I'm, I'm, I'm delivering my feces. Hopefully it won't be shit. <laughs> um, a circus artist also uses objects, you know, uh, the rope, a, a juggling ball, um, a trapeze, objects that, which they invest with an awful lot of desire since they train on it time after time after again. And, but the circus artist can also be an object, can also present themselves as an object of desire. They can also present themselves to a director or a choreographer as an object of their desire. And, you know, I could mention a few sadistic choreographers when I was a dancer that I worked with that used dancers as objects, as instruments for their idea ideas, <clears throat> who didn't treat them as subjects with their own agency. They become instruments. This has happens in circus as well, in many companies where artists are disposable, breakable, replaceable. Um, and obviously these, and, and this is perversion, being the object of someone else's desire, not wanting to be the subject of your own desire. And this research is about subjects of the study, the students and artists I talked to, interviewed, gave psychotherapy to, was about them searching and finding their, their own desire as subjects. And so the clearest expression of a perverse object is what we find in pornography. So before I get any further, let's make a further distinction between the subject and the object. The subject makes this circus object, and if I I'm, I'm imp improvising a little bit. I, I want to see the subject of circus on stage. I want to see the subject shine through in their truth. So the objects that I've met in my 20 years of working as a director, choreographer, and a teacher of circus, I've met uh, sailors on the rope. I've met uh, bunny rabbits juggling Easter eggs, postmen juggling into a post box. I've met gangsters, art thieves, escaped convicts, fairies, vampires, cleaners. A lot of cleaners. I don't know why that. <laughs> and the first question I ask is why? You have this fantastic practice, this amazing, yeah, superlative practice, and you want to be a cleaner. <laughs> this is, and this is the first. This is the first thing I ask. And the, there's one common feature here with psychoanalysis and circus. We give an account to you in circus. You know, we look to you. We say, this is for you. You know that I know that you know that I'm seducing you, or you know that I know that you know that I'm stunning you. And you give it back to me, I give it back to you. There's an imaginary, uh, there's, there's an effective loop that happens. You applaud, I do something more. You applaud more, I do something more. We have a, we have a little dialogue. So we're very clear that there's a, there's a dialogue happening here. And a, an account is being given to you. And the same thing happens in analysis. When you're on the couch, you give an account um, 
to your analyst. And in analysis, this account can be given in a variety of ways. The, the account can be given through lies and denials, and that's one way of telling the truth, insofar as the hysteric is concerned. I could give you a barrage of facts about my life, my CV, what I did, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And I can give you this barrage of facts in order to hide the truth, that I want to evade the truth, or I can keep you in suspension, I can keep you waiting for meaning to happen. And the analyst sits there patiently waiting for actually something to goddamn fucking well happen. And that's a perverse tactic. That's how a masochist will keep you in thrall by keeping you in suspense. This account is about knowledge, it's about what I know, it's about what I want to transmit to you as an artist. So I'm saying that circus is a form of knowledge, it's a form of research, it's a form of transmission. Not just the transmission of how to slide down unfeasibly fast on a rope or keep many objects simultaneously airbound or how to stay on my hands for one minute, that's a certain kind of knowledge. I'm saying it's also a research, if I view this psychoanalytically, a research into masochism, a research into obsessional neurosis or hysterical drama. I think it's a research into mastery and control and seduction. So there's, a, there's this uh, quantifiable, observable object of study. It's repeatable. This is the object of science. This, this backflip is a scientific formula that needs to be repeated. So there is a scientific quality to circus. How can I do this same trick again and again and again? How do, how do I test and prove my formula? So it's, that's, that's scientific, that's science. Um, so that, that, that's what I'm calling an object, this trick. Or this cleaner, which I successfully play every night. And yeah, that's also an object. But then there's a subject. There's a, there is a subject that speaks, that is a singularity, and that it is unrepeatable. Come on in. Let me allow, can I just humiliate you by drawing lots of attention to you? There we go. I'll come back to you later. And this subject only exists insofar as there is another to validate it. You're on an island telling your story to no one. It doesn't quite work the same, does it? You kind of need it repeated back to you. Um, so the subject of my research is this unrepeatable singularity. Okay, th there's a difference between a who and a what. So a subject, I'm calling a who, and an object, I'm calling a what. So I know what that is. That's 360 degrees, it's 45 miles an hour, it's 130 kilogram per whatever, on the backs of my knees, I, that's a what. Um, and I'll give you a very simple distinction between a who and a what, and it's using uh, Oedipus, ironically. Uh, you all know the story of Oedipus. He, um, he kills his father without knowing that it's his father. And then he goes on to marry his mother without knowing. Um, so he's at the gates of Thebes, and there's the Sphinx who asks him her riddle. The Sphinx says, you know, I'll recount the story. What was born on, four, what was born on, what animal? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've done this a hundred times. What animal was born and when it was very young walked on four legs, in the middle of its life walked on two legs, and at the end of its life walked on three legs. And there's a vase painting showing Oedipus and the Sphinx, and, the, and Oedipus is going, uh, man, you know, it's like a baby, adult, and then, you know, old man, it's a mime, stick, three legs, yeah, <laughs> catch up. Okay, uh, so Oedipus clearly knows what he is, man, but he doesn't know who he is. Even when he's king, he enters Thebes, he solved the riddle, he enters Thebes, he's the king, he knows what he is, he still doesn't know who he is. The tragic irony is, if he knew who he was, he wouldn't have ended up screwing his mother. So there's the tragedy, this is what we're looking at, we're looking at genealogy, we're looking at the roots of the circus in a circus subject. So when, when, a, when a student says to me, okay, I want to come on stage, yeah, right, as a cleaner, okay, okay, I want to come on stage and I, want to, and I find a ball, and then I, you know what, I'm going to clean, and then I'm going to find another ball, really? <laughs> and then I'm going to juggle. Fair enough. The, the thing is, is that, okay, we go, we go, at the beginning of the number, we go, okay, he's a cleaner, he's cleaning, there's a story happening, I kind of get it, there's something going on here. <clears throat> the second he starts to juggle something amazing, we 
it kind of short circuits. We kind of go, I don't care if he's a cleaner, you know, he could be a plumber for all I care. The idea is he struck us with something very physical, which we have, we have a direct physical empathy with. So the story kind of goes out the window. He forgets he's a cleaner. Um, they exist on two different registers. One is on the register of the symbolic. It's a, it's a symbolic fiction, a universe which we're invited to, to, uh, to believe in, with lots of metaphors that we kind of click, we join up all the dots. And the other is a pff, shatters. It's that, it's effect, it's shock. Um, it's a narrative universe that can't cope with the intrusion of the real, what I'm calling the real. Actually, we're gonna sh I'm going to show you something real in a second. Tom, do you want to go and get ready? Take your time. I might, have to, I might waffle a bit longer than normal. Um, it's, it's just like pornography, actually. Just like pornography. You know, it's kind of like... Um, uh, hello. Hello, I, I'm your plumber. I've come to clean your pipes. <laughs> Oh, yes, my pipes are really dirty. You're going to need a really big tool to... I've just got just the thing. <laughs> the second the real of the, of the pornographic act happens, everything is dissolved. There's no narrative universe anymore. We go directly to the real. So I think my contention, my... <clears throat> is that uh, the circus need this layering of metaphor upon something that's already metaphoric in order to validate something that gets you, gets you in, in the real. Um, Another quick example, while Tom gets ready, is that um, you know, imagine a, a romantic, a rom-com, Friends. Let's say Friends. Okay, Friends is happening, and Chandler and fucking I don't know, Phoebe have a romantic moment, and they go into the room. And what would happen in Friends if Phoebe took all her clothes off, and Chandler had an erection, and they did it? What what would happen to our experience of watching Friends, you know, with a cup of tea? <laughs> Um, this, is, this is another example of how the real and the symbolic narrative fiction just don't work together in quite the same way. Um, great. Let's see some circus. Tom, thank you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Tom was going to do that. Um, Tom was going to do that naked, um, but we decided against it because of the effects of the cold water. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a slow, slow one, isn't it? Um, so this is what this is one example of something I was I made a long time ago to try to make a circus act without tricks. I mean, literally, just, he's just climbing up and down. But there is a trick. 
And the trick is, is that rope isn't that slippery. <gasps> um, but that's what we, that's what we do. We, we, we deceive you, but I'll get back to that. But if, if Freud chose Oedipus as his, his founding myth for psychoanalysis, I'd much rather choose Sisyphus. Sisyphus rolls his boulder up, hill, doof, it rolls all the way back down, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, for eternity. Now, I climb up and down the rope, up and down the rope, and I don't get anywhere. I stand on my hands in order to stand back on my feet again, to stand back on my hands, to stand back, I don't get anywhere. I throw a ball, oh, in order to catch it, in order to throw it, in order to catch it. It's a very circular thing, it's a game, but there's an incredible amount of satisfaction to be had in that repetition wherein I don't actually get anywhere. Here I'm just trying to unconceal the possibility of failure and the, and the anxiety that we feel when, when we have this neurotic anxiety when we come out, and this is the crux of my argument, when we come out in front of you, actually, it's all about you. I don't know who you're going to be, this collective other that you are. Now, will you be, as I've heard it described, will you be wild dogs? Will you be gods who I must please? Will you be a void of potential revolution? Will you be a congregation? Will you be, as I've heard someone call you, like the sub-sub-subconscious, like the dark seas beyond the Antarctic, black rolling seas with 60-foot waves underneath which swim and squirm monsters which are unseen? Is that what you will be? Will you be the bathroom mirror where I see myself as fat again, or ugly, or unlovable? Or can I reframe you into the bathroom mirror where you become an accomplice to my narcissism? Thank you. So all these things I've, um, I've heard you described as, you know, and what am I then? Uh, a who is relational. So if this is the who that I project upon you, who am I? Am I a bait? Am I a sacrifice? Am I a god? Will you abandon me? Will you ignore me? Will you adore me? Worse, will you adore me too much? Will you come on stage and try to eat me and, con and consume me? So whatever it is, like today, I find myself in the same place again with anxiety occurring in the same place again, again and again and again. I repeat the situation. You know, when I said to myself a few days ago, how did I find myself in this situation? Duh, like I didn't know already that this was going to happen. But somehow I arrive there and I have all these um, symptoms of anxiety. You know, handing in, handing in papers late, not turning your mobile phone off at the theater. Again, turning up late to this lecture. Not handing this, not kind of writing this until last night. Um, all, all these neurotic objects, what kind of pleasure do we receive? from getting close to, to failure again and again. This is the symptom, the symptom which repeats, the symptom, the symptom which we do not have any control over, and we get some sort of perverse pleasure out of it. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. OK, so circus researched through the lens of psychoanalysis. It's what happens when psychoanalytic theory bumps up against circus practice. But not just that. It's how psychoanalytic practice looks to circus to understand and explore what kinds of theories circus has about itself. This is a bit circular, you know, what comes first, the theory you know, or, or a practice. You had a practice when you were children, maybe, play, you know, um, and you had theories about sexuality, you had theories about why the stars twinkled and how they stayed up there without strings, and where was the plug that you put the socket in in order for them to have electricity, like light bulbs. You had all kinds of theories. I tested a, a, two theories out through play as a, as a child. Um, uh, uh, my dad says, oh, don't touch this stuff underneath the sink, this stuff that unblocks the drains. It's, <clears throat> it's major poison. You'll die if you touch it. A few days later, I noticed that the glass of water on my windowsill has gone down a centimeter. So I asked my mum, who drank it? Who drank my water? And she said, uh, 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 the sun, the sun drank it. You know, she's trying to explain evaporation to me. So like a good old fashioned scientist, I, do a, I decided to do a good empirical experiment. I, I'm slightly sadistic, but I put the poisonous liquid into my water glass, put it on the windowsill to see if the sun is going to drink it. Is the sun stupid enough to drink it? So I come home from school a few days later, and I'd forgotten about this exercise because I've got other experiments on the go, you know. Uh, and uh, I come back home, and it's a typical hot, hot English day, which means there's no sun, it's just grey. And I come back from school after a few days, and the water glass has shrunk that much. And I look at it and I go, fuck, I've killed the sun. <laughs> like, oh shit. Um, but this curiosity 
Um, but I was testing out my parents' theses. And it's this curiosity, I think, that defines, is one of the major defining factors of a circus artist, is, hmm, theory, how can I throw one ball here through there, up there, standing on one leg with a teapot on my head while still simultaneously going on a unicycle? You know, how can I make life really, really difficult for myself? Um, and it's kind of that's what we prove. Or how can I effortlessly flip up onto someone else's hands at the same time, then go to my feet? Um, we've, got, we've got theories. And I wonder sometimes, you know, if we think about the theories of our parents, the theories are things like, it's bad to jump up and down on that bed. It's bad to climb that tree. You mustn't play with knives because it's dangerous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Please don't swim out too far. These are desires that have been snipped in the bud, and there's things that we have enjoyed. And once the body enjoys something, it does not want to let it go. And if it's been prohibited or it's been repressed, it will find sneaky ways through to enjoyment. Um, I wonder sometimes whether we want to put our parent theses, parent theses into parentheses to bracket them so that we can have independent mastery of our own knowledge. So don't tell me that that lamppost is what that lamppost is for. I might want to climb that lamppost and then slide backwards down it. Don't tell me that that bed is just for sleeping, because that bed is also for doing a cartwheel on, etc. We're kind of it's slightly transgressive what we, what we do as circus artists. So it, it'll find a way to sneak through in, in some sort of metaphoric way, as desire does in dreams, as desire does in the symptom, and most importantly, how, how the desire slips through metaphorically in the symptom. Um, and the symptom acts metaphor metaphorically, as does the circus act. So, okay, I put circus on the analyst's couch. <clears throat> I, you know, I literally put circus artists on my crotch, couch. I put them on my couch to find this new theory, circumanalysis, which asks the circus artist about what theories they have about what they do with their bodies in front of another person. This is super important. I keep on emphasizing um, this. But it's interesting, talking about the Freudian slip, I normally write circus on the coach, <clears throat> not circus on the couch. It almost feels like I want to give circus a ticket and then put it on a coach and say, say goodbye to it, like I want to be cured of it. And the important thing about the Freudian slip is that it tells the truth. It's, um, it's knowledge that speaks all by itself. And Lacan says the unconscious does not bullshit. And Okay, I'll give you an example of this. My first Freudian slip in analysis. A friend of mine had been sectioned, uh, meaning that she'd been put into a, uh, an institution for being mad. And she was, put into, she was sectioned because she was discovered standing on a table in a builder's cafe, builder's cafe at 7 o'clock in the morning, singing the Ave Marie in a bright blue evening dress, pouring a jug of milk over her head, thinking that she was the Virgin Mary. I wish I'd been there. So in analysis, talking about this situation, which was very important to me, instead of saying the word sections, I said the word sanctioned. My therapist went, go with that, John Paul, go with that. So there I spoke the truth. I, in one way, there was an official text of the ego. Fact, 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 fact. This all happened. And then I fuck up. Then at the end of all that fact, 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 I make a mistake. I say sanctioned instead of sectioned. The story doesn't tell you anything about my feeling towards my friend who went mad. When I say it sanctioned her, that tells you a whole load of other stuff about my truth. So the unconscious talks through me which literally means I don't own it, it's not mine. Um, but it's what one can hope to produce in analysis via the transference. The transference very quickly being when feelings towards a very important person, significant person in your life, are transferred onto the person of the analyst, unconsciously. And there is certainly a transference happening here right now, and there is certainly a transference happening in the Circus Act when we completely admit the fact that you, are, that you are here. Every time I meet an analyst and talk about my research, the only thing they're interested in is what is the transference. And so, it, so, we, so uh, artist on the couch, me sitting here, and we're, we're talking, mostly they're talking, um, looking to produce the um, transference. This situation is a prototype for the actual act. So can I be, can I get in, can I slide into, into the position of the other in the analysis? Can we start to figure out what your problem is? 
with the other, what your issues are with the other, how you want to relate to the other. I don't go and watch them do their numbers. I don't want to be affected by the beauty and the eroticism and the power of what they do. That's imaginary. No, we only work symbolically with the word, word as symbol. For example, you know, you don't go to analysis and talk about the problems you have with your lover and then invite your analyst into the bedroom to watch what... Oh, it's a bit obsessive there. No, no, try that. It's a bit hysterical. No, no, it's not. And just one thing about all these little jokes that I'm slipping in. Um, it's not just for me, it's not just me entertaining you, because I think my theses are boring or anything like that. Um, it's, uh, it's the show, actually, that truth is... An no. Jokes are another way that the, the truth uh, emerges by accident through the unconscious. Um, and actually, I just said that so in order just to show you what a lie looks like, because I just lied, actually. These jokes are in there so you don't run away and ignore me and abandon me. They are there. In lying, I told the truth. This is what we look for in analysis. We look for the lies and denials. For example, in the case of the hysteric, who lies and denies things. And sometimes it's not the content of what they're saying. It's not what they're talking about. It's the defense mechanism that they're using that, that we look for. In this case, lies and denial. So actually, the rope is a penis. <clears throat> so these defense mechanisms, um, these, to put it very simply, these defense mechanisms, yeah, these defense mechanisms I'm not drunk, sorry. <laughs> These defense mechanisms are what, make the what are what make things unconscious. They are things that are unpalatable to our ego identity story. They're things that we don't want to admit of ourselves. They're traumatic things, they're seductions from the past, they're humiliations, moments of pain or, or loss that we don't want to admit to. These are the things we stuff in the unconscious. And these are the things that creep out <clears throat> in activities like repetition compulsion. Okay, I use the word repetition compulsion because um, I come to the same scene of the crime again and again and again. <clears throat> Every night I come back here to do the same thing again and again. There's something kind of similar there to repetition compulsion. And repetition compulsion is the idea that a traumatic incident happens, or, a seduct or which is to do with seduction, humiliation, loss, pain, something like that, gets stored in the unconscious, and you recreate the scene of the crime in various metaphorized ways in order to retroactively deal with the thing that you have repressed. Um, so I find myself again here, like a rabbit in the headlights. Um, so my analogy between circus practices and repetition compulsions stem from the mutual ground that they share in control, mastery, and trauma. And this goes to the heart of what circus does. Circus is traumatic. For those of you who've merely seen circus and seen how effortless effortlessly we perform it. And repetition compulsions, the circus act and the symptom are all communications. And every communication has a destination. And one of the, one of the questions of my research was, you know, what is the destination for you of your act? And <laughs> this is the thing that was most, um, this was the question that was the most, uh, the most the same across most of my Participants, you know, who is the, who is the audience to you? Who are they to you? Who do you do this for? Who do you do your act for? And uh, you know, it's kind of like, hello, yeah, okay, <clears throat> hi, Anthony, okay, right, Anthony, welcome. Uh, so, 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 who is the audience for you? I mean, sorry, excuse. You know, basically, there's a silence, incredible silence. You think to yourself, well, the audience is your enabling condition. What you're telling me, you've never thought about them. Anyway, sorry, back to Anthony. Sorry about that, Anthony. Um, so, yeah, so who, who, yeah, who is the audience to you? Oh. Uh, mm. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I didn't... It's funny. So you said I could say like anything that came into my head, right? Right, okay, so you're not gonna judge. Okay, well, okay, so this is not quite your answer to your question, but I had a dream. <clears throat> wait, wait, okay, right. I'd... Sorry, wait, wait. Um... <sighs> a 
Okay, so like we lived on the ninth floor of a of a council flat, and uh, and I used to really so the, so the height thing is there. I used to love throwing water balloons onto like little old ladies, and I used to watch the water balloons, you know. And I started smoking really early, about five. So I used to watch the spiral of this, and uh, so there's that. This is the, oh, anyway, uh, and I was really afraid of the dark as well. So because the dark was like um, you don't know what's out there. Uh, and there could be a monster out there. The monster could be here, <sighs> and you wouldn't you wouldn't know. And, and in particular, vampires was was my f I just ugh, don't know what it was about, about vampires. Anyway, so I have I have this recurring dream, and so I wake up in the dream, and uh, uh, there's like a power cut. There's no like there's no like lights. I try all the light switches, and there's no kind of um, light. And I'm just kind of uh, scrambling around uh, uh, in the dark, and I think okay, I'll just try and find. I go into my mum's room to. Um, to um, uh, try and she's not she's not there, and uh, <clears throat> I go to my dad's room. Um, I, you know, my mum and dad don't sleep in the same room because they, my dad snores like a pig. Um, and I, I go into my dad's room, and he's not there, and I, I start really fucking freaking out actually. Um, in the dream, I, and I, st I, f I you know I feel abandoned. I, I feel like, like uh, <sighs> uh, and then, anyway, there's a no there's a knock on the door, um, and uh, I, I f okay, I, maybe it's my parents. They're back from the neighbours. They've maybe just had a sherry down the road with. George and Mildred, the neighbours, um, and uh, so I open the door, um, and uh, uh, there they are, my parents. Uh, something weird though, like they've got a weird look on their face. They're like kind of, it's like kind of, and I'm looking up at them, and I go, okay, and uh, so they go, um, evening, Anthony. Are you gonna let us in? We're really hungry, and then I notice that they have the like the teeth and the gl the glittery glittery eyes, and I, oh, that's too weird. So I, I run and I run through the house to try and find somewhere to hide, and there's obviously nowhere to hide because they're my parents who've now turned into vampires. And so I reckon to myself, okay, I'm going to climb on top of the um, um on the wardrobe by the by the windowsill, and then I'm going to climb up, and then they probably won't be able to. I'm I'm smaller than them, so I, they probably won't be able to follow me up. And then I realise that um I've locked myself in the room that they're there and they're slowly making their way to the cupboard uh, and they're going to climb up because they're vampires now, they can do anything. Um, so I look out the window and I see the concrete nine floors below and I'm, not, I'm four years old but I'm not stupid. I know that if I jump out the window uh, I'll explode like a, like a boy balloon um, but that seems preferable. At least I know what that is. I've got no idea what, what, what they will do approaching me. I have no idea what, how, how they will, what they will do to me as the vampires. I, mean, I, I do know that um, splushing myself onto the floor, um, at least I know what that is and I feel much more comfortable with that so I jump. <laughs> and actually... <sighs> I fall really slowly, <laughs> and it's beautiful, and the air is rushing through my ears, my pyjamas are fluttering, <sighs> and then suddenly I land <sighs> on the ground like Superman or something, <sighs> it feels great, and actually I, 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 the vampires don't come back because uh, cause they know I can just jump out of the window, and actually I don't need the vampires anymore to give me an excuse to jump out of the window because it just feels good. Um, you know, Freud um, observes his grandson play with a, a, a cotton reel attached to a piece of string, and the little boy kind of goes, speaks the word, there, here, there, here. <clears throat> and Freud um, thinks that the little boy is playing, making a game of the fact that his mother comes and goes, over which he has no control. Now, here means presence, obviously, care, milk, nurturing, love. There means absence, annihilation, not presence. And I wonder if, if this isn't kind of a, I don't know, an interesting parable for circus. You know, I'm, I'm here, and I'm safe, I'm on here, and up there <clears throat> lies danger, the possibility of unpresence, of absence. Okay, so I'll climb, I climb, I get to the top, Suddenly, I'm on the rope. I'm here. I know what I'm doing. I'm holding on. I'm safe. It's there on the hard floor below where danger lies. The wire walker, you know, I'm here on my platform. Ooh, I'm going there. Ooh, doubt, doubt, doubt. Suddenly, I arrive here. I'm safe again. The juggler, here, safe, in my hand. It's there. Ooh, am I going to catch it? Here. Here, there, here, there. 
hither, 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 hither. Um, uh, it's the kind of it's a kind of here is a is libido connection and there is death and disconnection. So you know a boy jumps out of a window to escape the vampire parents. Two girls uh, run away from uh, an old lady that crawls out of a picture. They get into their parents' camper van and they fly away. Um, artists say you, you know as identifications for when they were children. Quote Power Rangers, superheroes, Spider-Man, Shaolin monks. Um, you know, they develop superpowers to, to, to fight the monsters, all of these things. Um, circus artists seem, seem to have kind of drawn that, that material, that childish fantasy material, into what, into what they do. Um, okay, time for some circus again, I think. Uh, Sorry, yeah, but the interesting thing is, is that um, this other seems to be a slight black hole, uh, something absent in the discourse of all the artists that I've been speaking to. One artist says to me, it's a geography that she's ignored. That's a nice way of putting it. This is a geography. We are, she is part of a geography. The dream puts you in a very specific landscape. The unconscious puts you in a very specific geography and says, deal with that. This is what the water rope is. There you go. Deal with that. It's, it's, asking, it's a message waiting to be um, decoded. One last thing. Um, I feel well, what led me to the research was that I thought the circus was rather manic. One trick after another, trying to puddle an audience into submission by trick after trick after trick. So I decided to explore melancholia a little bit. Um, the flip side of mania. Mania and melancholia are both denials of grief. So I did a lot of research into melancholia. Turned out to be a bit of a dead end. Um, so I made a very long, boring piece about it. And I'm going to show some of it to you now. <laughs>
Thanks, Sonny. I was a bit depressed when I made that piece. Um, so on a concluding note, um, all this talk about repetition compulsion and the symptom, it might, it might sound like I'm saying that circus is pathological and fixated at an infantile stage. I'm not going to be that down on it. It's, that's not what I'm trying to say. Um, it's essentially that uh, the, this, this thing of psychotherapy is about getting to know your symptom. It's about knowledge production. It's about pedagogy. <clears throat> it's about circo analysis being a pedagogy of the self. The, the analyst doesn't know anything. This thing of the analyst being the subject supposed to know. I don't know anything about you. You have to tell me. Um, so it's about, it's about students and artists really delving within themselves to discover um, their own desires away from the demands of circus. This piece here is me trying to excise myself from the demands of circus so that desire can start to move. And all, all I would say to conclude is that um, if I am framing the circus act as a symptom, then I would say enjoy it to the artist. I would say enjoy your symptom. There is no subject without a symptom. And without your symptom, um, you wouldn't be you. Um, so, in, in which I'm saying is enjoy it, don't let it enjoy you like a parasite. Use the energy caused by the friction between psychic fantasy and external reality and use it to generate work. Um, yeah, em embrace your symptom is what I would say. Thanks. <clears throat>